In 29 BC, something unique happened in the Roman world. The winner of the latest series of civil wars was proclaimed a god. The heir of Julius Caesar, this guy here, Octavian Julius Caesar, consul of Rome, he was treated like a god, get this, while still alive. That, that, was, that was completely unprecedented in Roman history. Now, Roman citizens were not allowed to worship Caesar as a god, at least not technically anyway. Here's a perfect example. Octavian Caesar's best friend, the amazing polymath Agrippa, he built this building, the Pantheon. Uh, remarkable structure. Uh, it's to all the gods of Rome, the whole pantheon of gods, to worship them all, big temple. But to get inside the pantheon, get this, you had to walk past a massive statue of Caesar. So you had to go past him to get in to the gods. Now, one provincial city, a city not in Rome proper, decided to take things further. Uh, they really got into this idea of a divine human leader, and that city was Pergamum. Uh, Pergamum, in the province of Asia, built a temple to Octavius, uh, this temple right here, and the people worshipped there. In fact, over the next two centuries, it became a very popular place of worship. Not long after that, after they built that temple, the Roman Senate gave uh, Caesar this title, Imperator Caesar Divi Filius Augustus, Imperator Caesar Augustus, Son of God, and that is how the Pergamum Temple became known. It was the house of worship for the august son of God who held the imperium. The imperium is the power of death, okay? Now, that is very important background if we're going to grasp something that took place 120 years later. About 120 years later, the true deity, the son of God, Messiah Jesus, speaks to Christians. And he specifically addresses those Christians who were living in the very difficult city of Pergamum. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 2. Let's read the opening of Jesus' address. Revelation 2, let's read verse 12 and the first part of verse 13. Write to the angel, Jesus says, of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Stop there. As we underline the, uh, understate the headline in your notes, uh, Jesus speaks to Pergamum. You got a worship guide when you came in, open it up, look on the left-hand side. Jesus speaks to Pergamum, and Jesus is the one with the sharp, double-edged sword. Now, when we study chapter 1, we learn that John uses this image often. The, the sword represents power and authority, what the Romans called imperium, right? But when you read chapter 1, it's telling and fascinating that Jesus doesn't wield his imperium the same way mere humans do. We, we learn that the sword is not in Jesus' hand. It comes out of his what, everybody? Do you know? Out of his mouth. It comes from his mouth. This is a symbol of the power of his word. The image comes from Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, Isaiah is, is speaking forward about the Messiah, and speaking about the Messiah, he says this, verse 4, But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his what, everybody? mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked this brings up a contrast that is very very important in understanding this letter to Pergamum unlike Augustus Jesus really did show divinity you see Jesus conquered death Augustus merely prescribed death for anybody who opposed him and he did Augustus uh, every one of the ancient sources agrees about this his humility he pretended to be very humble it was it was a very thin charade not so Jesus, fully God, he became fully human. He washed human feet. He, he died on the cross for mere human beings. Augustus Caesar has the imperium, he did. He, he's the only one to have the imperium through his whole life, the power of death. Jesus has something better. He has the power of life, amen? Now, here's maybe the most important contrast of all. In a break with Roman tradition, this was a huge break with Roman tradition, Augustus was always, all of his life, he was depicted in his prime, right? Every coin, every temple, every statue, and they were manifold around the Mediterranean world, all showed him in his flattering prime. But all those coins and statues couldn't hide the fact that he was weak and ill, he eventually became old, and he died. And Augustus Caesar stayed dead. His ashes were interred in his magnificent tomb he built for himself just on the edge of the city of Rome. Jesus, on the other hand, rose from the grave, proving his divinity. He is glorified forever. 
And the living Jesus speaking the sword from his mouth changes everything. This is much bigger and different than Augustus's imperium. Uh, Alan Johnson has a really great comment on this. I liked it so much I put it in your notes. Look what he says. The Christians in Pergamum were thus reminded that though they lived under the rule of an almost unlimited imperium, they were citizens of another kingdom, that of him who needs no other sword than that of his mouth. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Now, a bit more on Pergamum is in order. The the city-state of Pergamum is kind of hard for us to, to... to wrap our heads around. So I want to help us understand it in relation to some modern American cities. I think if we'll take some traits of modern American cities, it will help us understand Pergamum. Uh, Let's start with San Francisco, California. San Francisco, California, like Pergamum, is a city full of pride over its progressive status. Um, Here in the early 21st century, uh, San Francisco is beset by tent cities of people who are seeking government help. Uh, The city has a real struggle with this. There are squatters all over San Francisco. They are just getting by with enough city-state support to stay, but not enough to move on. And they are marring the beautiful city with disease and filth. It's bad for them, and it's bad for everybody else. In fact, do you know what the number one most popular app in San Francisco is right now on phones? It is the app to avoid uh, human feces on streets. Yeah, it's a Waze app, but it shows you where there's poop, all right? I guess it's called the poop app. But um, (laughs) that I bring up for this reason. That is almost exactly what you would have seen outside of this complex, the the Asculipium, or also called the Asculptorium, which was down the hill. Pergamum was on a huge acropolis, and down the hill they had this massive, massive, in fact, it was the greatest healing complex in the world. Okay, it was, it was to Asclepius, the god of healing, and it was huge. If you took all of the hospitals in Frisco and their physical acreage footprint and put them together, it is not as large as the Asclepium is in, in Pergamum. But get this, now listen, no one was allowed inside the Asculapium. No one was allowed in if they couldn't pay or they were likely to die. You couldn't let really sick people in or it might ruin your record, you know, so they they weren't allowed in. The poorest and the most ill had to wait outside. Now, there was a special zone where they were allowed to camp, and they were allowed to beg, and unlike every other citizen of Pergamum for whom it was illegal, they were allowed to defecate in public, just like modern San Francisco. The Pergamese paid really high taxes, and they did this in order to give a small public grain ration every day to these squatters in the tent city. It seems like, from what I can tell, it made the ill and the needy unwilling to go anywhere else, and yet not really able to go forward. Uh, The Pergamese, like the modern San Franciscans, considered this the height of compassion. Okay? Think San Francisco, you get a little taste of Pergamum. Then add some Las Vegas, all right? Especially the The creepy, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, nonsense, right? The Roman poets give us a whole lot of evidence that Pergamum was a center of wanton sexuality. Now, they're not unique in this. Sexual license was a big part of all the original Greek cities of Asia, a big part of all the Greek cities of Asia, but only Corinth was more famous than Pergamum for its wanton sexuality. Also, Pergamum was a little like our New York City. Uh, New York City and Pergamum were each a former national capital, uh, but each of them became the center of the publishing world. In fact, Pergamum led in parchment production. Uh, The very word parchment, which is what everything uh, of import was written on then, the very word parchment is a slang takeoff on Pergamos, which was the original Greek name of the Roman Pergamum. They, They so led in parchment production, they were known as Parchment City, Uh, and they had the second greatest library in the world. Get this, the Pergamum Library in the first century A.D. had 200,000 volumes, 200,000 scrolls. Can you believe that? Only Alexandria had more books than Pergamum did. And just as New York City was once the capital of the United States, so Pergamum was once the capital of the province of Asia. When Attalus III died, he left his whole kingdom, the, what we call the province of Asia, to the city of Rome. And, uh, and originally, Pergamum was the capital. It was pretty quickly moved down to Ephesus, just as our capital moved to D.C. But just as New York City remains the first city in the United States of America, Pliny the Elder writes uh, this in the 200s A.D., Pergamum is the most important city in Asia. All right, one more, just to make sure we get it. Add a little bit to those other cities, add a little bit of Portland, Oregon, okay? 
Here are the aspects of Portland that fit Pergamum, uh, of modern Portland. Uh, a lot of dulling and hallucinogenic drugs used legally and a government that is very intolerant of any dissent, okay? Um, anybody who tries to abstain from the cultural hegemony today in Oregon is punished, often severely. Just ask Oregonians like uh, the Kleins, the former owners of Sweet Cakes by Melissa. By the way, their persecution was just overturned this week in the U.S. Supreme Court. Did you hear that? Yeah, it's pretty cool. But that doesn't mean it's going to end. Similarly, at Pergamum, there's a very old legend. I can't confirm this, but it is a really old legend. Uh, we have it from in the second century, that two Christian stonecutters refused to use their artistic ability to carve a statue of Asclepios, and they were killed for it. Okay? So, that takes us to worship at Pergamum. The worship at Pergamum brought danger. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is, yet you're holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death among you, where Satan lives. Now, some pastors will say that Satan's throne is this place, the magnificent uh, temple to Zeus in Pergamum. I, I've heard that, but I cannot find any confirmation of that in classical sources at all. So that, that actually may be a fabrication. Instead, it might be better to take Satan's throne as a euphemism. Uh, it's, it's a way of just saying this was a really, really dark and demonic place, okay? Worship is especially difficult in that dark and demonic place because the Christians stick out like sore thumbs, especially because the Christians will not participate in or cheer on the seamier side of Greco-Roman society. Pagan worship brought wealth. People flocked to Pergamum for the emperor worship, that temple I showed you earlier, and also the amazingly expensive temples to Dionysius, this one right here, and Zeus and Athena. But most of all, <clears throat> people from all around the world traveled to visit the Asclepturium, the hospital complex. Now, don't think of this as modern medicine. Okay, Some of it actually was, was valid and useful. A lot of it was hocus-pocus nonsense. But all of it, the useful and the useless, was rooted in a pagan ecological view of human health. The anthropology was flawed from the beginning. That's why the medicine ends up flawed. Um, I, I can't really explain it as well as Johnny Beaner does in this funny little clip. Take a look, modern comedian Johnny Beaner. We're just very different, my wife and I were very different. We come from different backgrounds. Like I came from a normal family, you know? <laughs> she, she just came from like a hippy dippy family, you know? Her, her dad's an actual hippy, her mom's a holistic nurse. And I just, if, first of all, if you don't know what holistic medicine is, it's basically like, remember when you were little and you'd play house, you know? You, like, you pretend you had to go to the doctor, but you're a kid, so you don't have medical equipment, so you just kind of use sticks and rocks and stuff. You know, that's holistic medicine. <laughs> the god Asclepius was honored in this huge complex of buildings, brought massive riches to the city. Here's how their version of holistic medicine worked. When you went to the Asclepium, you learned special secrets from the gods, and those formed the core of the Asclepius worship. And it was a journey for you that was assisted by sexual promiscuity, not always, but almost always, and always by hallucinogenic drugs. You took, you took lots of drugs. If you learned well, then you were healed, or at least you believed you were healed for a time. Here's how it worked. This is my favorite part of the Pergamum Hospital. You took a bunch of really, really heavy-duty hallucinogen drugs, okay? And then you walked through this tunnel. And the tunnel would be filled with water about up to your waist. You can see some of the, the water lines here. And as you walked through the tunnel and you went through in your fog through the water, you're swishing through the water, um, there were these priests that were hidden up above. And they were, there were these small holes up here as openings. And the priests in the small openings would say, you're feeling better. You're getting well. You feel better. Right? And by the time you wandered out through the end, you had basically been hypnotized into believing, I'm well. Right? It was just as absurd as our fake faith healers today. You really believed in that the God had healed you. All of this made pagan Pergamum a really likely place for the growth of Gnosticism, I'll explain that in a moment, and the secret mystery religions. Most of all, it made Pergamum a very dangerous place for a believer in Jesus. Just ask Antipas. He was slain because he was a faithful witness to Christ. 
Now, we don't know the details of Antipas' death, but I highly recommend this historical fiction book, The Lost Letters of Pergamum. Uh, it deals, you'll rarely hear me say this about historical fiction, it deals very well with the history. Uh, and Bruce Longenecker's book is interesting and has a very moving version of what could have been Antipas' martyrdom. Here's what we know for certain. The pagans needed someone to blame for the people who weren't really healed, okay? Remember, in pagan worship, the God has to be appeased by you following the exact right formula. If you say anything wrong or there's any negative energy or anyone does anything wrong, it messes it up, right? You control the God. You get what you want by making sure that you do the right formula. That's what paganism is. So that one darn Christian who refuses to worship, that could be the last straw that causes the God not to give somebody what they desire, so in retaliation, it was becoming normal for Christians to be viewed as a threat. Believers in Jesus were increasingly being barred from pagan public life. They were resented and sometimes even killed. Thank goodness that kind of nonsense doesn't ever reoccur in our day. Let me show you an excellent summary of this attitude as it's lived out in the modern West. Uh, somewhat astonishingly, this is not from a Christian source at all. This appeared on the editorial page of the most popular newspaper in this country. An alarming number of politicians and commentators prefer to nurse petty resentments that they elevate to a moral denunciation. These high priests of resentment, is that a brilliant phrase? Isn't that great? When, when you write, Craig, when you write the history of this era, I think the chapter, there ought to be a chapter called the high priest of resentment. That, that is really well said. These high priests of resentment are offering one useful lesson. They are reminding their fellow citizens what an impoverished secular religion they offer. The rest of us can ask instead whether we would really want to live in the bitter world of envy politics or whether we prefer to lift our eyes, our economic aspirations, and our spirits to greater things, close quote. It seems the world still suffers from the high priests of resentment. In that kind of resentful environment, Jesus encourages the Christians, look, he encourages them for holding to his name. Remember this, a name in ancient and classical writing, it represents the sum of who a person is. When you hold to someone's name, you are tied into the truth of them, their character, their style, their, their ethic. Uh, think, think of it like this. Anybody here have a really great older sister? You have a... You have a wonderful older sister. Raise your hand if you have a great older sister. Okay, what's your older sister's name? Go ahead, Sarah. Give me one trait about Sarah that is wonderful. Very reliable, always there if you need her. Okay, so if we were writing about you and we said she really held to Sarah's name, then, then using that terminology, we would understand that means you're being very reliable. You're there when people need you. You're in Sarah's name. You're living according to her ethic. You got it? Okay. That's the issue in verse 13. The Pergamese Christians are doing what all of us should do. They are holding to Jesus' name. That means they're living out Jesus' ethic, his truth. But it's not all good news. 14 through 16. Take a look. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So repent, otherwise I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. As we summarize on the right side of our notes, Jesus also exhorts the church. The sin of Balaam. It's a wonderful shorthand for a big problem in churches. Here's the problem. It is participation in city life, state life, at the expense of idolatry. You see, Balaam was a two-part offender in the Old Testament. First, he tried to curse Israel. Uh, the warlord of Moab, a guy named Balak, he paid Balaam a pretty good sum of money to step out and curse the Israelites. And he said, hey, I'd like the dough. I'll give it a shot. He took the gig and he tried only in a hilarious twist. God made his words come out funny so that he actually ended up blessing the Israelites. Still wanting to get the money for the job, he said, wait, wait, I got another idea. I got a second idea. Let's use a secondary plan, and, uh, and we're going to have the women of Moab seduce the Israelite men and use lust to convince these men to sacrifice to our, the, the God of Moab, who, by the way, was called Baal Peor. Now, the worship of Baal Peor was basically an orgy that included a lot of well-done barbecue. I, I, I don't know how to describe it other than that. It, it, was, it was a sacrifice to Baal uh, with really good barbecue and a lot of weird sex, okay? Now, 
How does that kind of nasty idolatry flesh itself out, no pun intended, in Pergamum? This issue is huge. This is a huge one in the Roman world, and I would say increasingly in your world as well. It gets to the heart of how does a Christian interact with world culture. About 100 years ago, the historian Will Durant summarized it really, really well. Look what, look what he said. He said, at the center and summit of a Greco city like Pergamum was the shrine of the city god. Now, get, get this. Participation in the worship of the god was the sign, privilege, and requisite of citizenship. This was required. You got it? That, that's what's behind the sin of Balaam. It is participation in city life at the expense of idolatry. Durant continues with these notes. I liked them. I, I put them in your notes. In the early spring, uh, he's trying to describe what life was like in these cities that were originally Greek and had become Roman. In the early spring, the Greek cities celebrated the Athesterion, or Feast of Flowers, a three-day festival to Dionysius. By the way, remember, he had a big, beautiful temple at Pergamum, uh, in which wine flowed freely and everyone was more or less drunk. At the end of March came the great Dionysia, a widely observed series of processionals and plays accompanied by general revelry. At the beginning of April, various cities in Greece celebrated, including Pergamum, Aphrodite's great festival, the Aphrodisia. And on that occasion, for those who cared to take part, sexual license was the order of the day. Yuck. That is the sin of Balaam as it was experienced in Pergamum and all the other Greco-Roman cities. The problem is the church in Pergamum is doing nothing about those who are completely caving into culture. Look, you have some. You see that in your text? It uses the verb echo. What word does that come into English as? Comes in English as what word? Echo. Comes in as echo. Uh, and it, it has a wide range of meaning, but when it's used like this, it means to have a very close relationship. That's what echo means, very close relationship. These are church members who have a very close relationship. They're just echoing the culture. They're living as raunchy as the lost people around them. Same corruption, same sexual immorality, gluttony, laziness, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. And the church, look, has these people. The church leaders just echo their sin. They're close buddies, so their sin never gets rebuked. The church is just an echo chamber. There's no attempt to try to correct anyone lovingly. No, no, we're just, it's okay, we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, right? Aren't you glad we're not like that? I mean, we never just echo the world. We never let our Christian friends do stupid, sinful things while we just remain silent, right? <clears throat> Wrong. We are just as much an echo chamber as Pergamum, and that, my friends, that must change. That must change. How? It changes by holding each other accountable for purity. Now, I had to think of a way to try and depict this that would relate to this congregation. <clears throat> Since you cannot throw a brick here without killing an engineer, <laughs> I decided on a flow chart. <laughs> All right, here you go. Yes, you're, you're, you're welcome, you're welcome. All right, it's pretty simple, it's pretty simple. You've got a brother or sister in Christ and they say or do something. Do you like it? Let's say you don't, or let's say you do. Yes, I like what they said or did. Then you gotta ask yourself this question, is that just because we're an echo chamber? I'm just not willing to confront anything, I don't really, I don't really believe anything's right or wrong, it just, I, it just, I don't wanna cause any way, it's just echo chamber. If that's not the case, no, no, it's what they said or did was truly good, well then great. But if that's true, if it's just because you're an echo chamber, then go back to Jesus' word, look at it. <clears throat> but I have a few things against you, you have some there who hold. Uh, in verse 17, we're going to read this. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Go back to the Word. All right, now let's look at the other side. Let's say I don't like what he or she says or does. Let's, there's two issues here. One, is it a debatable issue? Is it something where there's room for disagreement in the Scripture? It's not, it's not a cut and dried right or wrong issue. If it is, if it is a debatable issue, well, yeah, you, could, you, you know, Sean and Gus, I've heard it both ways. Then, then the answer is, leave him alone. Leave him alone. You're not the Holy Spirit. They don't have to agree with you about cloth diapers or whatever it is you're fighting over, right? <laughs> Romans chapter 14, verse 3. One who eats must not look down on the one who does not eat. The one who does not eat must not judge the one who does because God has accepted him. Got it? But what if it is not a debatable issue? No, this, this, is, a, this is a right and wrong issue in Scripture. Well, then you take him to Jesus' word. Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins... Go and show him his fault in private. There's one exception to this. 
1 Timothy 5 says that if you are an elder or pastor, then, then you have to have this done in public. Ugh. Who wants our job, right? Okay. Okay, so, so do, do I like what he says or does? No, debatable issue. But what if it's this? The last question, what if it's because my feelings are hurt? This is increasingly the issue uh, in our world. Well, I, I don't like it because my feelings were hurt. Uh, well, if it's just because my feelings were hurt, yes, that's really the only reason I'm upset is my feelings were hurt. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Just let it go. Your feelings are not the arbitration of truth. I know, shocking, but listen, listen please. Proverbs 19, 11, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Got it? It's a glory to overlook something that just hurts your feelings. But if it's not just my feelings, my feelings may be hurt, but this really is a biblical issue, then take them to Jesus' word. Listen to it again. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. That is how we respond to the ever-present in every church sin of Balaam. Responsible, biblical, gracious accountability. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. For you non-engineers, just go to lunch with one of them. They'll explain it in stories. You'll like it. All right. Now, just like the church at Ephesus we studied last time, <clears throat> Pergamum was also plagued with the teaching of these Nicolaitans. And as we noted, this is a form of a weird religion called the Gnosticism. Okay? Gnosticism. Um, I really think the best explanation of what are the, who are the Nicolaitans comes from somebody that lived very close to that time period. Irenaeus was a church leader. He actually grew up in this area, and not very long after Jesus dictated these letters, Irenaeus wrote a book. It's called Against Heresies, and here's how he described the Nicolaitans and Gnosticism in general. John, the disciple of the Lord, preaches this faith and seeks, by the proclamation of the gospel, to remove that error disseminated among men a long time ago previously by those termed Nicolaitans, who are an offset of that knowledge, and the word he uses here is gnosis, so he's saying they're part of Gnosticism, falsely so-called, Gnosticism is falsely called knowledge, and here he explains why, that he might confound them and persuade them there is but one God who made all things by his word, all right? As he points out, Gnosticism did not believe in the triune God who is one. They certainly did not believe that God is creator. Gnosticism instead was a Greek-type mystery religion, and it was based on one earning one's way to divinity through knowledge, especially through knowledge that was expressed in harmony with nature, all right? In Gnosticism, God does not speak. There's no God who speaks. He does not draw his people to himself. He does not redeem his creation. In fact, the Gnostic God's not even really a sovereign God. People work their way to deity by being one with nature in a very wild and impure way, very impure. That's Gnosticism. Now, you would think, gross, why is anybody attracted to that? Let me tell you why humans are attracted to this kind of paganism. It feels spiritual. It feels spiritual. It has a veneer of Christianity. You can kind of make it sort of sound like Christianity. Here's the best part. You can do this, and you seem holy, but you get to be just as impure as you want, right? You can be just as nasty and impure as you want and call yourself holy, and most of all, it leaves the human being in charge. Salvation always seems better to our warped minds if we earn it, if it's accomplished our way. But however attractive it might be, Gnosticism is frankly ridiculous. It's dangerous. It is morally, intellectually, and spiritually bankrupt. That's why Jesus says, repent, change your mind, move away from that lunacy. Otherwise, there's going to be great pain. Look, if we don't repent, if we remain impure, here's what the Bible says. We're going to lose rewards in eternity. It's not in this text necessarily, but Paul describes that in great detail in other passages. Uh, we experience the pain of God's word, convicted, the sword from his mouth. He's going to fight against them. The sword, which Hebrews says pierces between soul and spirit. That hurts. I know. I, I've been pierced by God and his word when I've chosen to sin. It's wonderful and painful. We see a weakening of the redeemed community. Jesus loves this church. That's why he wants these people to repent. And then in the short term, maybe the worst thing in the short term is we become indistinguishable from the culture around us, and we are always enslaved to the ever-changing morality of the day, right? That's what happens if we don't repent. Our elder, uh, Randall Satchel, sent me a great note on this. Look what Randall wrote me, and he said, Wayne, in the polytheistic Greek and Roman culture of the first century, it was common to adopt new gods and worship them in addition to previously known gods. There was no necessary change of former habits and practices. But when one becomes a Christian, 
everything past is laid bare for the lie that it is. Christians are described as born again, grafted into new stock, transferred from one kingdom to another. As a Christian, you're not the same as you were before. You're changed. Jesus is telling the church at Pergamum, stop acting like who you were and be who you are. Peter gave the same advice to the dispersed Christian Jews. Paul gave the same advice to the Ephesians and Colossians. We all need this advice because our surrounding cultural pressures are not so different today. We should all read this advice on a regular basis. Repent as needed and live according to who we are in Christ. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. So, the real Lord, Jesus, speaks His words. He encourages, He exhorts, and Jesus reminds this church of the blessings that are to come. Verse 17. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone. And on the stone a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. Jesus reminds the church that his people will possess the eternally true and great secrets of God's grace. We will. This is why we mustn't lose focus on our real and eternal blessings, wasting time on temporary, tainted things. Now, the images that Jesus uses here are especially divergent from the false religious idea of gnosis. In fact, I, I think the Lord is having a really great laugh here at the expense of the Nicolaitans. Let, let, let me explain. Look, hidden manna. Hidden man. Now, that could be a physical thing. I don't know what the manna is. It, it could be uh, describing some reward that you and I are not prepared currently to even understand but either way the way he says this is designed to drive a gnostic absolutely crazy okay it's hidden and it's reserved for eternity you can't find it jesus gives it no one discovers it no one gets knowledge and works their way to it nobody earns it ah! so frustrating for a nikolai eaton i think that is a scream it's absolutely hilarious same thing with the white stone before you write me and say, what is this white stone? Let me just tell you the answer. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It, it's unknown, and, but, but that's the point. No one can get to that knowledge, that gnosis, except through Jesus, except through faith in Jesus. There are speculations that this might be also making fun of some pagan religions. Uh, there's no way to know. There were pagan religions that said the, the great God's name was hidden on a stone and you couldn't find it because if you had that name, you would have power over him. I, it, it, that's just a parallel guess. The point is it doesn't matter. We will eternally possess the great truths of God's grace. Awesome things are going to be revealed to us by God's will. Do you see that? I will give by God's will, not earned through our work. Now, that leads us to a really important question. What am I settling for that pales in comparison to the sure blessings that are to come? You see, the, these blessings are guaranteed to the one who conquers. And of course, that causes you, brilliant as you are, to ask a follow-up question in your echo chamber voice. You're asking, who, who, who is the one, what, one, who conquers, conquers, overcomes, victorious? Great question. Thank you so much for asking, asking, asking. There are three general views of what Jesus and John could mean by the one who conquers. There are three big schools of thought on this. And if we can do a little theology for a minute, I think it could be important for you to walk through all of them. Just real quickly. Option A. Option A is a person who displays that he is truly regenerate by activity commensurate with justification. Now, here's what that means. To be justified is to be made right before God. It's a very important biblical term. It happens by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. The people who believe in option A do believe that you are justified by God's grace. What they're saying is the one who overcomes is the one whose sanctification, their life on this earth, is lived out in a way that is in keeping with that justification. Um, the normal assumption is that if you don't meet this unspecified standard, whatever it is, that you will either lose the justification or far more often you're going to hear it will prove you never really had it, okay? This view is sometimes called perseverance. Uh, one of the main problems in it is it's never defined. It's rarely limited to these particular commands that are given to the seven churches. Instead, there's a whole host of scriptural and quite frankly often awe scriptural things and they change with each generation, the things you have to do supposedly to show that you were really Justified. That's option A. All right? Option B is a believer in Jesus who earns heavenly rewards at the Bema. That's the judgment seat of Christ, which is in the future for every Christian. 
And, and at that judgment that's only for Christians, we'll receive honors, awards for the service we did in this life. That's very true. And that rewards view fits really well with the tone of the letters. It certainly fits well with all of Paul's writings. And that's great. The problem is, option B has a, has a big problem. It doesn't deal effectively with the key word in Revelation. The key word in John's writing in Revelation elsewhere is Nike or as you would say, Nike, uh, Nike. Nike means to overcome, to conquer, to be victorious, right? And the way John uses Nike, that doesn't fit well with it, but that could be what overcomer means, somebody who gets rewards in heaven. Option C is a person who believes in Jesus for salvation. Now, the arguments for this one are really strong. Uh, they do draw from other texts like the others. One of the strongest things about this one, though, is the very use of the word Nike. John says this, he says, ho Nikon. That's, what, that's the way it's written every time in all seven of these letters, right? Ho Nikon. Well, that is the exact same construction he uses in 1 John chapter 5, verse 5, when John writes, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And everybody agrees in that passage it's saying an overcomer is a believer in Christ. Is it A, is it the person who's the prover? Is it B, the rewarded person? Or is it C, the believer? Many years ago, uh, a wonderful pastor named uh, Criswell, Dr. W.A. Criswell of Dallas, convinced me that C is the answer to this question. He basically convinced me with a lot of threat of beatings. But anyway, <laughs> um, and you think I'm exaggerating. Anyway, Criswell could be wrong. I could be wrong. But I'd like you to at least consider C. It rarely gets much attention, and I think textually it makes the most sense, especially as just believing is the strongest contrast to the Gnostic idea of earning salvation. Uh, but, but no matter which you determine is the right definition of Honeycon, whatever you come up with, it still takes you back to the same question. A, B, or C, it takes you back to this question. What am I settling for now that pales in comparison to the blessings that Jesus promises the overcomer? What impurities are messing up my life? How am I trusting my own formula, my own knowledge, instead of trusting in Jesus alone? What needs to change so that I better hold to Jesus' name in an increasingly hostile world? Let's pray about that. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters and for myself that in, that in this world that is ever-changing and yet never-changing, that we will hold to Jesus' name and that we will not be an echo chamber. Lord, Lord, I pray that we will quit settling for less, that we will live according to these amazing blessings of grace that are ours in Jesus Christ. That needs your intervention. We need your help that the impurities may be continually removed from our lives. We know ultimately you're going to make all things new and we will be glorified. Amen, amen. But we want to enjoy and praise you now. Help us, please. In Jesus' name, amen.